action. Well, good afternoon. I'm Casey, and welcome to Heavy Metal Hackers. Um, as you can see, we're playing on six classes. Uh, this first one we're going to talk about uh, just general metalworking equipment, uh, get you all in the field for what's out there, what, what is available, both uh, at the hobbyist level and a little bit beyond. Um, and then, of course, this class uh, key is going to be about safety and how to bring the right safety gear. Um, it's not quite so much as much safety practices. We're all going to keep a good, sharp, watchful, family-friendly eye out uh, on everybody. But what I really need you to do is bring the right gear when we're going to actually fire up welding equipment. Um, that alone is going to keep you a lot safer than just about any other guys can give you. Um, next week, we're going to do uh, oxy assembly and welding, and we're going to actually get some welding done. Um, really cutting things, shaping things. I'm also going to show you how to do some soldering, like uh, plumbing pipe soldering. Um, it's a pretty neat thing. It's pretty easy to do. I uh, learned that when I was in uh, middle school, actually. So, fun stuff. Uh, 28th, uh, the next <coughs> class, we're going to do some fabrication work, uh, talk about machine shop tools, uh, drill presses, uh, saws. Um, I don't have a lather and mill here, unfortunately, but we can at least look at it, talk about it, we'll watch some video on it, get a feel for it, what our appetite, maybe start dreaming of having some sort of a fundraiser to get one, maybe, huh? Yeah. But uh, fabrication is really important. Uh, any kind of welding. 90% of it is just setting it up, and, and that's what fabrication is really about. It's not actually about the welding, it's about the cutting, it's about the planning, it's about the layout, um, it's about the little tricks that you learn. So that's really what that class is going to be about. I put the oxygen settling class next week because I'm sure a lot of people just want to get the welding, get the burning stuff quick. So we're going to do that next week, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about fabrication the week after that. Uh, my favorite thing is MIG. That's going to come up on November 4th. Um, MIG is also known as Metal Winter Gas. Um, it's a wire feed welder with a gas to shield it. It makes a beautiful clean weld. It's really easy. It requires a little bit of work to set it up. It uh, requires a little bit more cost than oxyacetylene to get started. But once you have it, I mean, everybody should have a MIG. It just, everybody should have a MIG. It's just amazing stuff. And also, uh, I'm going to start working with some actual specific materials then. Uh, I've got a big old 4x8 sheet of sheet metal at home that I'm going to be cutting up, and I should have it in nice little sample pieces for the November 4th class. And then also some tubing. Hope to have some tubing cutters and tubing vendors by then, and, and we can practice putting a few joints together. Um, on the 11th, uh, arc welding. Big, the, the original uh, foundry of, uh, of all welding, I guess, really comes down to arc welding. Arc welding was out before oxyacetylene even. Uh, somebody figured out how to make electricity and spark two wires together, and, and that's how arc welding got started. Anything that came before that was the smithing in the following class. Uh, but arc welding, uh, if anybody has one or anybody wants to get one, we still need one. I, both my, my dad and my stepdad have been arc welders for a long time. I've, I've done it before, but we actually don't have one yet. We will have one by the class, but if anybody has one or anybody wants to get one, we'll talk about it later in the class. You're more than welcome to get it and bring it so we can use it to actually <coughs> teach everybody else. Um, also, we're going we're gonna to move on from sheet metal and tubing. We're going to talk about angle iron, some heavier, heavier welding uh, during that class, plate. And, oh boy, the complexities of aluminum. Does anybody in here, somebody sent me an email asking if we we're going to cover aluminum. I'm not sure who that was, but we're going to cover aluminum, but aluminum is a real tricky, elusive beast for a hobbyist. Um, it's the right material you want to use for so many hobby projects. It's lightweight, it's sturdy, but it's a real beast to weld. So uh, t t generally it's going to cost the most money to get started welding aluminum. Uh, anything can be welded with gas, but aluminum is a lot harder with gas because it, uh, it develops a, uh, a coating on it almost immediately that when we get started, we'll get a chance to see. Uh, it makes it difficult to work with. So it, aluminum is a, is a, is a real, real neat beast. And then the last class I'm setting up for some of the more exotic stuff. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, was in on this last year. There was a thread in the club about sand casting. We got a guy that built a, a beautiful Prusa printer, uh, 3D printer, and he also is a big uh, aluminum metal caster. Um, I went out to his house and checked out his setup, and I've done quite a bit of research online, and I have one under construction in my garage right now. Uh, certainly, I'd be ready for in the next six weeks to, to do some pours right here in the, uh, in the lot at the hacker space. Um, and then we'll take that a little bit further. If anybody wants some additional information, I've got the, the, the Gingri series book on how to make your own lathe, mill, uh, drill press, and all that from aluminum castings that you can build in your garage or in your hacker space. And uh, Noah had not done it. I do know a guy who has done it, Mr. Uh, uh, Jeff Nading, uh, who was a bit of an associate of us. Uh, I've seen it done, and I'm excited to do it. And hopefully, maybe we'll get our at least a small uh, lathe and mill in the hacker space uh, from that that process. Um, let's see, smithing. 
My New Year's resolution this year, since my New Year's resolution the previous years was to get a, a welding set, and then a, a MIG, and then do certain things, this year's New Year's resolution is to have my own blacksmith smithy set up by the end of the year. I'm barely going to get it. I'm going to have me a little coal pit, and I'm going to have an um, anvil, but I'm going to have it by the end of the year, and it's just personal passion. Uh, so we're going to talk about what I've learned so far, and hopefully I should have my anvil by then. I better have it handy, and uh, show off some of the things uh, that I've got going. And anything else that comes up, anything else anybody else brings up, oh. we'll be on. No problem. Oh, Perfect sorry. timing. Okay. Perfect timing. So right. there's the Casey, <laughs> how much does it make welder? Um, so the cheapest one, you can get a cruddy one from uh, from uh, Harbor Freight for you know, 200 250 something like that. Hmm. I got a pretty nice Hobart over there. I paid 600 for that one. It's, it's, it's got name brand recognition. It's, <coughs> it's smooth. It's clean. You kind of feel confident with it. Um, uh, at the same time, I regret not buying uh, one that had a aluminum spool on the gun. Now we'll get into that later, but you know, with an aluminum spool on the end of the gun, aluminum becomes possible with a MIG. Theoretically, you can push it through the umbilical, but good luck letting that happen with a uh, aluminum is very soft and it just binds up. What you got, Rob? Hey, the, uh, the the MIG welders that you can get from Harbor Freight are they are they really that bad? Or? No, no, they're, they're totally usable. I mean, and here's the other thing about it: the most important thing about a MIG welder from Harbor Freight is get it get it home and use it. If it's gonna work, it's gonna work. If it doesn't work, you can take it back. I have yeah. never had a problem taking anything back. I've never heard of anybody having a problem taking things back. I mean, dude, human beings in China make stuff every day. You just have to watch the QC process, make sure you got a good one. I mean, sometimes you take the same brand back and you get a perfectly good one next. So yeah, I totally would, would not. In fact, I think the next one I buy would probably be a, a straight up no brand Chinese made. So, so not, not a problem there. How much is an arc one? Uh, the cheapest arc welder, if I can't find any help before that class, uh, they have a $79 arc welder at, huh. uh, at, at Harbor Freight. Now, it's an inverter base, so it's DC only. Um, we'll get into some of the specifics of what all that means. But the bottom line is you can get a pretty small uh, welding rod, and you can weld anything that a hacker space would probably need. Um, so sheet metal welding, make a little project box or something, or uh, fix, uh, I know we want to fix these... Uh, these uh, lockers over here, that kind of stuff is easy to do. Now you start welding on girders, trying to build a tractor out of it, that's not going to happen with a little $79 welder, but pretty much anything made around here is possible. Would you get a decent one for 200 um, Actually, we'll talk about the decent one here in a little bit, about 300 and change is the, is the, the super, super stalwart uh, Lincoln buzz box that everybody really wants to attain to. So you're looking at about three. Christmas present. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. not. Ready for the class, but... Okay, <laughs> okay, well, hopefully I'll pull it off. I don't know, we'll see. What you got, Mike? Uh, you'll probably cover this later, but is, <clears throat> what's the difference between an arc welder and like what Frederick's um, high voltage thing? Remember his, like, the screwdriver? Oh, yeah, with the little, the little fractal demonstration yeah. there. I'm not yeah. sure, Frederick, it's a real high well, voltage it's just a flyback transformer, transformer it, basically. It's, yeah, it just shoots uh, out juice. The, the one I have is basically just a transformer. It just generates 25,000 volts. Yeah. At 25 kilohertz, and that's all it does. So it just puts out sparks. Our uh -huh. welder is going to be high current. Exactly. Lower voltage. Yes. High current. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The voltages are like 10 to 20, 30 volts. That's it. But they're running really high amps, like 200 amps. Wow. So the, the, the current is what gives you the, yes. the heat. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Next slide, please. Woohoo! Okay. So what is a hacker? Perhaps maker is a more appropriate term. Next slide, please. In my definition, <coughs> no problem. Next slide. That's okay, man. Just pick it up. <laughs> so, hackers are average folks. A little above average curiosity, but insatiable, insatiable ingenuity using household materials. Fail. Next slide. <coughs> Cardboard. <laughs> Next slide. <time. laughs> What's it say? Make it what? Make it yeah. here. <laughs> Duct tape. Uh -huh. <laughs> and next slide. That's awful. <laughs> Jeremy's <laughs> personal favorite, hot glue. <laughs> What's wrong with hot glue? <laughs> I hate hot glue. <laughs> <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> did Faraday build his cage out of cardboard? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Next. <clears throat> yeah, so what are you doing, dude? <laughs> Next. Go. It's all right. We'll get through this. <laughs> so metalwork in 
aluminum steel, aluminum welding, fabrication. This stuff is not that hard, it's not that expensive. Cue the, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see I was having a few beers last night when I was putting this together. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get back to spirit now, huh? <laughs> we're going to talk about what we're going to go over here. Um, so the next slide. All right, so what the first workshop was going to cover is, first off, we're having an overview. We're doing it right now. Um, in a few seconds, we're going to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, we're going to talk about the safety gear. That's the biggest thing about the class is not necessarily safety, like safety procedures or, you know, don't cut your finger. It's really about getting the right gear for the future classes so that the safety stuff is kind of automatic, um, so to speak. Not to say that it's not, not going to have to be a little bit of uh, So we're going to talk about what to buy, where to go buy it. Um, you know, Harbor Freight, we love them, uh, but don't buy uh, your fancy gloves or your, your thick gloves from Harbor Freight. They fit really terribly. Uh, little things like that we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, shoot. Um, where, do you have <laughs> Oh, no, I, I bought some. Oh, all right. Uh, more yeah. <laughs> you can see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> You'll see I have plenty, too, so oh, okay. it's up to your taste. Right? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, welding methods, we're going to talk about the basic methods we're going to cover. We're going to talk about MIG. We're going to talk about uh, um, uh, oxyacetylene, uh, TIG. I'm going to cover TIG briefly, and uh, ARC. Uh, equipment setups, uh, we're going to look at some of the various types you can buy. I'll talk to you about what you really need to have the whole setup. You, know, you go out and buy a $300 welder or a $500 welder, that's not everything you need. And we'll talk about the stuff that's the bare minimum, what you need to get started, what you can buy first. And... Okay, next slide. Hmm. Yeah, so who the hell is this guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> His name's Coda. Uh, the guy holding him, uh, that's me. Uh, next slide. About that? Yeah, my name's Coda Ray Kibaya. I'm Wishes Rick and Baka Cola, and also known as KC. Uh, yes, I'm just kidding about the other. Let's just rip about your stuff. Next slide. Yeah, so the, the dots came off after a while, and I just became Casey for the last 10 years. Um, started off my life, uh, grew up with, uh, yeah, it is a really big fish. Uh, I grew up with two, uh, with a dad and a stepdad. They're both welders. Uh, my stepdad was a certified pipe fitter. Um, I didn't personally tutelage under him or anything like that, not trying to, to, to show off uh, that, that, but uh, I know that I grew up with welders in the house, the material was around, the metal was around, uh, I had my hands on a little bit, I really regret not spending a lot more time learning about it when I had a master welder in the same group, you know, so what you, what you, what you think about your parents once you've grown up, huh? What you got, Rob? Hey, what, what makes a master welder? Do you have to get, like, certified? Yes, there is, American Welding Society, AWS, is um, sort of a, I don't know, they're kind of like the, I, uh, the ISO 9000 combined with a union to make a you know an organization that, that sets quality standards and things like that for welding, um, and they have uh, some things we'll talk about. We'll look at them in the future. But a good example is uh, a master welding test would be to take uh, two pieces of pipe, uh, say 12 inches around and you know 12 inches long on each side, mount it to some frame, and you have to weld it upside down and around the circle and all the way around the other side. And then when they're done, they'll cut it and they'll look at it like with, uh, with non-destructive testing methods like Sonic or whatever to make sure that you got it all the way through and all the way around. When you weld for a while, uh, now I don't possess the years of experience and the right vernacular for this right now, but you can imagine, I would hope, there's a certain thing that you just get to understand once you've been doing it a lot and you're used to seeing that molten metal puddle. You, you get a lot of these, uh, these intangible understandings of what you're doing. And your welds just get better. I mean, you get less bubbling, you get less inclusions, you get less slag in there. And once you've done that for a while, once you've taken a, you know, this is a hobbyist class, once you've taken a professional class and you've learned from a master welder, they'll teach you the real specifics. Not gonna get there here. We're gonna get to ice broken here in this class. I am by no means a master welder, but I am a master hobbyist, I know that, so. <laughs> but yes, there are very specific criteria. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff to learn. The American Welding Society website, AWS, look them up. Um, it, you, you can't read enough. I mean, you can read the rest of your life and you wouldn't get through with all the stuff there is to read about welding. It's great stuff. So, answer your question? Yeah. So anyway, uh, safety. I'm gonna run the show as the nicest dictator you've ever met. I'm a little discombobulated. It's the first class I've ever done. But if anything turns out to be safe, if any of you mentions anything to me that it, it's, it, you don't feel it's safe, we'll stop. We'll think about it. If I feel unsure, I'll consult all of you. We'll all think about it for a while. We'll talk about what's safe and what's not safe before we move on. There's no such thing as, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of whatsoever. I mean, we're a bunch of nerds in a hacker space right now, so nobody should be ashamed about a damn thing. So if anything feels unsafe, bring it up. 
We'll think about it, we'll talk about it, it's exactly what you should be doing in the real world. The slower you go, the safer you're gonna go. That's pretty much the, pretty much the rules of the game. So I'm not gonna tolerate anybody making fun of anybody or worrying about uh, you know, not mentioning things safety. So we definitely don't wanna get hurt here, period. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of money for you to sue us for, so uh, you don't wanna get hurt because you're not gonna get anything out of it. Oh, did everybody find liability? Yeah, <laughs> they will before they fire the first torch, okay. all right? We'll make sure that happens. Yeah. <laughs> So, the main thing about the safety part of the class is long pants, preferably denim jeans or Dickies type work pants. I came today with a huge hole in my knee. I will not do that on the day that I plan on welding. Um, I just threw these on, I didn't think about it until the last minute, but I know for a fact I will not weld with these because I don't want to get my knee burned. It's annoying when you get sparked. So, um, let's see. Dickies are great. Um, they're, I, I, just, I can't say enough about that material. I love, love Dickies. Uh, tight fitting pants are not advisory because you're going to feel the burns rather than them sitting there cooling off on the pants. But again, you don't want to wear your gangster baggy jeans either because you're going to get them stuck in uh, the grinder or you're going to be snagging the metal on them or whatever. So just regular fitting pants. Everybody here seems to be fine when I see today. Uh, looks good. Leather shoes or boots, <coughs> closed toe, socks not visible is a big thing. We don't want sparks landing on your delicate socks, getting inside of your ankle and burning you. So as long as your pants are long enough to cover, you can wear flat, uh, flat shoes. You don't have to wear hikers or, or boots if you don't want to. You can wear restaurant shoes if they're made of leather, as long as they're just not, you know, they're going to resist heat for at least a minute or so, uh, so your, your toes don't get burned. Hair or jewelry, I don't see anybody here with long hair, but if you got a necklace, make sure it's tucked in. If you got hair, make sure it's pulled back. Um, you're Beards. certainly not discriminating against girls here. Beards. Yes, yes, beards. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, I don't know, is it? <clears throat> I'm kind of thinking about the hair that goes down the heel. Yeah, no, that's no, no, no. Yeah, really I was thinking about. But yeah, <laughs> my beard gets that long, I'll be proud. <laughs> So long sleeve cotton, leather, wool, specialty uh, metal and hot work, they have specialty uh, materials. I don't know what you'd call them. They may be made of cotton, they may be made of leather, or they may be made of all sorts of space age materials, but they'll be specific metal hot work stuff made by Miller or Lincoln or one of the other welding brands. Um, as long as it's a long sleeve shirt, I've got an example over here. You know, this is about the minimum. It's just, it's a final jacket. You know, it'll protect your, your arms. It's not made of nylon. It won't burst into flames, most likely. Uh, just something to protect your arms. You don't need to wear it the whole time, just when you're actually working and you're actually up against the work. So if it's a little warm, you take your jacket off between the holding periods, that's fine. That's what I do. I've got a little leather jacket over there that I throw on, throw off, left and right. You know, jacket on, jacket off. You know, Denim you know. work shirts. <laughs> Denim work shirt, excellent. I have some pictures later on in the presentation. Leather gloves. Big rule. I want leather gloves to be worn at all times within about within about 10 feet of the workspace. I'm thinking about, I'm gonna see if I can line out an area around, I'm not sure what the parking lot surface looks gravel. like, but maybe, is it gravel? I'll see if I can't line out some kind of an area, but the point is, you're if you get involved, if you're, if you're coming to the class, you're taking the time to come to the class, chances are you're gonna be interested in what we're doing. You're gonna see somebody doing something, you're gonna see a piece of metal about to fall, you're gonna maybe, you could possibly trip, I just, if you're that close to the hot work area, you just keep a pair of gloves on. They don't have to be super protective, thick padded gloves. They can be a second pair. I'm gonna recommend it a little bit that you get at least two pairs of gloves for the different situations. So they can be your smaller pair. I just want everybody to have a pair of gloves on that's close to the hot, hot stuff. Um, a face shield. Face shield or goggles. Uh, you want them all times when you're actually working. It is really easy to take them off. It happens all the time, even I do it. Luckily, I have glasses on. They help protect me. These are actually company provided uh, safety glasses, polycarbonate, yada, yada. Uh, they don't have the side shield, so I don't even like myself not having my regular prescription safety glasses here that have built in side shields on. Um, also, if you have a pair of the goggles like, uh, like uh, Mike bought, um, sorry, Mike Chris bought, um, they have a flip up. I got them, I got them right there. Yeah, they, they flip up. And these are pretty, pretty, pretty handy so that you can protect your eyes when you're gas welding and then you flip them up and you can see clearly what you're working with. It gets a little annoying, but you also get used to it. Trust me, you work with this stuff enough and you're excited about welding, you know, the, some of the pains and discomforts will go away pretty quick because you'll be like more into what you're doing and worrying about the pain. So, and it's not like it's pain, it's just annoyance. Um, face shield, also um, welding mask, a welding helmet. Um, I have one that I took the took the lens out of just for grinding. It's clear, but it still protects my whole face. Very few people actually go that far, but I love it because I can well, you know, I can grind like a madman because I've got good protection. <laughs> so, and if you're gonna flip it up to inspect, make sure you got safety glasses underneath because it always it never fails. You just want to make that last 
just get that last corner ground off and something flies off the wheel right in your eyeball. It's annoying. And, and, at least. So uh, the different lenses. Uh, another thing that uh, Chris learned. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, the ones that are selling at Harbor Freight right now for like three or four bucks or five bucks, they have a number 10 lens. The number 10 lens is really dark. It's like darker than the number 10. It's like, you know, the, the gangster as gangster wouldn't use number 10 on their windows because they can't even see out of it. Um, <laughs> it is what you would call welding tint. The problem with it is that unless you're outside in the bright sunlight, you can't see a doggone thing without them on. So what you end up doing is you end up getting everything just right. You get your rod ready to go. You get your MIG ready to go. And then you you flip it down and then you're blind until you start it and then you can see from the glow of the light that you've got going from the arc and when the arc sparks out you're lost again you've got to stop take it off fix it so mm -hmm. that's the reason why we're going to look into automatic helmets in the you know in the future i've got one over there too they're a godsend they're a miracle uh, greatest invention i think in a long time um, but likewise when you're doing gas welding a lot of times i choose to use gas welding because it's more convenient it doesn't get nearly as bright, but it still gets plenty hot to work with. And it's recommended to use only a number five lens, which is like really, really dark sunglasses. And they're much more usable in a, in a, a regular garage environment or shop environment with some decent overhead lighting. Is so, that what I got? What's that? Is that what I got? Well, I'm not sure. I have a collection over here. I have some replacement lenses that I got at Northern Tool. I have an eight, a nine, and a ten. And I also have a pair of number five goggles. Yes, yours are, yours appear to oh, be number five. Is that fire? Yes. That's fire? Yes, yours are number five. So those are gonna be great for, but now Frederick, on the other hand, you don't want to use oh, them, okay. you don't want to use them for arc welding or for MIG welding because the MIG flash is too bright for those. That's not really gonna protect your eyes for that. But again, that's a uh, cheap investment. So you can buy just the glass? Yes, so you can. And I have so some right here, as far as I know, you can borrow mine. I have no problem so with mine. Okay, so, yeah, so basically yeah. I could buy another set of glass? Yes. The only place that I know, okay, so there's oh, a lot yeah. of welding tools around town. Like 15 bucks. Yeah. For the whole thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the glass should be less than 10 a piece. Um, I got those from Northern Tool, I think, for like 8 or $9 a piece. You should be able to get those lenses at any welding shop. Uh, another, another note right now, welding shops are only open Monday through Friday from freaking 7 to 9, or yeah. 7 to 5. That is it. Those guys have a universal conspiracy to not be open on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get it before four, 5 o'clock on Friday, you ain't getting it until Monday morning. So make sure that if you're going to do it, uh, you have two options. You have Harbor Freight, and you have a, or you have a Northern Tool has a better selection, and then um, a welding shop before uh, before 5. I, I don't know if I'm probably going to go into this. Are there any good welding shops around here? Yes. Cool. I mean, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, this is the seventh largest city in the nation. It's a very industrial, very blue-collar city. There's lots of good welding stuff, lots of good metalworking here. Uh, a good story, uh, this, this is supposed to be about safety share experiences, but I'll give you this one now while I'm thinking about it. Um, if you read the book that I recommended that comes in, it, Lowe's and Depot both carry them. Uh, Northern Tool carries it as well. And I've got two copies over here for you guys to look at and uh, check a look at. But the, the guy in the book talks about another one of the conspiracies of the welding industry is that they won't fill a bottle that they didn't sell you or that they didn't lease you. And sometimes they'll sell you a $99 lease for, you know, 100 bucks or something, and it's good for or a 99-year lease for 100 bucks. They just want to insist on you coming back to them to get your gas in the future. And a lot of the companies, especially in more remote towns, they won't honor any, anything but their own bottles. Mm -hmm. Now in San Antonio, we got a lot of, you know, I don't know if there's a place in San Antonio called Alamo Welling Supply. I just joke about it all the time. There's gotta be an Alamo Welling Supply in San Antonio, right? Everything here is Alamo. I mean, they probably got Alamo beer here. I haven't found it yet, I know it's here. Yeah, so, <laughs> Do they? Yeah, see, they got Alamo everything. They probably got, good. They got Alamo gravel, they got Alamo ironworks, they got Alamo steel, they got Alamo. Go ahead. So anyway, what I, <clears throat> Lost my train of thought. We're right out the window. Uh, there you go to welding shops around here. Welding shops, yes. So the moral of that story was there's a lot of places in town that will fill up any bottle. Okay. Um, you got a shop around for me, you got a lift for me. Yeah, they're probably going to get the dirtier shops. But I don't know yet. Uh, and I've been meaning to ask. There's a professional welder down the street from me that keeps a set of bottles in the back of his truck all the time. I've been meaning to ask him for a long time. I haven't done it yet. But I go to Prax Air. Okay. They're, they're like a mile from my house. It's just convenience. Hmm. I am almost certain I'm paying too much but the convenience is more than I care to even bother looking for. Sure. Um, so I paid about 300 bucks to buy one of their bottles, uh, about yay tall bottle, and then it cost me between 30 and $50 a, a shot to fill them, mm. and they last a long time. Mm. So it's definitely, once you pay that huge initial chunk, 
It's how, how much is the bottle? Sorry. The bottle, the, the bottle I bought from Praxair, the fairly decent sized bottles that I'm recommending uh -huh. to, to hobbyists get, will cost about 300 bucks okay. to cool. get started. And you need two, and you need an oxygen, and a set, and that's the huge hit. Yeah. So gotcha. I think you can get them probably about five if you get them both together. I think they want to sell you a smaller acetylene because you go through oxygen a lot faster. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, that's it for. So how about shared experiences? You know, I figured Matt would have a lot of experiences to tell us about burning his leg off or anything. You guys got anything? Uh, Anything come to mind? Uh, as far as safety? Yeah. I was yeah. talking to my friend, and uh, she was a professional welder for a number of years. Yes. On the on the shoes, she said that's the most overlooked thing. Indeed. And um, she recommended uh, boots and shoes that don't have laces because the laces will catch the slag. Yes. And you can't kick the slag off. Right. So it'll end up burning it your foot. There. And... Um, she recommended like a denim work shirt and she also said if you catch or rather when you catch fire don't panic <laughs> just <laughs> pat it out yes uh, <laughs> yeah that's another and it's not safety. a it's not an if but when yeah <laughs> you'll notice that I keep a um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've stolen the hacker spaces fire extinguisher so I don't get my own down here mm. but um, I also keep uh, my hoses are real close to where I work I have uh, my water hose um, there's no real fear about uh, water. I know a lot of fires, you're worried about using the various chemicals and all that stuff. Water's a perfectly good solution for most most fires. Even electric arc, you're gonna have the arc off by the time you're stuck, something's caught on fire. You're rushing for the hose. You let go of the trigger, so um, do what you gotta do to get the fire out. Um, let's see. Uh, fire extinguisher is a good idea. Let's see, anybody got anything else? There's more slides. If anything comes up again, safety is serious. It's important. You can't do it if you're if you're wounded. I mean, I've got a little got a little uh, scar right here from the last time I was gas welding something in a hurry, and I got the torch uh, flame beneath the uh, cuff of the glove, and just for three seconds, and it made a nice cook mark down my. <laughs> but uh, it was right back to welding in about five minutes. So uh, yeah, so field trip. If you click on this screen, if you actually double click on this, do we have internet on that laptop, uh, Chris? Yes, should. You just double click on the picture there. And no luck. All right, so there's a website out there. Uh, it's called Weld Guru, and I really like it. It's got some really good stuff as far as um, you know, little chapters succinct about the different sections of welding. They've got a great safety that's more along the lines of the stuff that Frederick and I were talking about. The kind of safety you give kind of safety speech you'd give to kids in the first day of class, um, and it covers more specifics other than just get the right equipment and the rest will follow. Um, so that's a good place to, uh, to look. We'll talk about it some more on the individual days as we're doing individual work. I'll point out some more specific <coughs> uh, dangers. Uh, next slide. All right, so gloves. Oh. Cool. Like yeah, throw a fox was an issue. There she is. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we'll move. We'll, we can move forward until we until it interrupts. Can you close that thing? Uh, hold on. Uh, <laughs> it's showing up there, but not here. It's probably just hit enter because it's highlighted. Interesting. Uh oh. Technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Oh, yeah. okay. I think I tried multiple times, so I just. Gotcha. Oh, oh, wait. Go back. Oh, go back. Hey, there we go. Yeah, so see if you can go back one more? Yeah, yeah, we'll go back. Okay. Sure. All right, so leather, leather, leather. Uh, <laughs> cotton, cloth, they might work in certain applications, but you need leather. Leather is just the best stuff to use. Uh, you're going to want two pairs. Um, a padded leather pair with uh, thick leather and thick padding, which is um, Frederick. You bought some, brought some pretty good ones. Um, you can, you can see yeah. the cheap shit I got. Yeah. Uh, these are, these are all right. They got, they got some padding in them. They got some, uh, some kind of a cotton-looking flannelish stuff inside of them, yeah. and then they also have leather on the outside. <coughs> this is a pretty thick, heavy, uncomfortable. Uh, as far as it's, they're not the kind of uh, leather that some lady's gonna wear to a ball. Uh -huh. um, it's a good thick stuff. <laughs> you're gonna burn them. It has an interesting smell. Um, and you're gonna get, you're gonna burn them again. Uh, also, as you burn them, they get hard and unworkable, so you won't wanna be burning them if you don't 
have to because uh, you'll have to end up buying new ones. These have like a denim inside and I can feel that there's some padding uh, up here near the fingers. You're going to want to just grab hot stuff and work with it. Um, and you'll feel the heat coming and then you'll have some of those moments where you're like, damn, it's getting hot. Ah, ah, ah. And you'll take them off and you'll wait a few seconds. The thicker the padding, the more work you're going to be able to do before you have to take them off and, and wait a minute. <laughs> what you got? What, what, what's the price, like median price for something that's really nice? I would say about 15 bucks. Okay. For real decent ones. Um, how much were those? The hot 15. Yeah. The Harbor are... Freight special is like $3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really like those. I have a pair of those. I also have an odd one because my dog ate a loose, a single one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, as you can see, the dog ate one, and even I, I had the Harbor Freight ones, and I went out and bought another set of the $15 Lincolns. Mm. So. So anyway, padded leather, and then also uh, some better, a better fitting pair. Not so much padding, padding as much as they are for the dexterous work. And I've got a uh, smaller pair here. These are deer skin gloves. The fingers are more defined. Um, there's no padding, but it is still definitely leather. But I can feel my fingertips in these, so I can do more, more particular work with these. Um, if I'm not actually welding, but I'm working with the metal that was just recently welded, I might throw these on so I can get some more particulars out of them. So I definitely recommend at least two pairs of gloves. Uh, next slide. Yeah, well, you're not inspecting the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more. We've all seen the, the Lincoln Electric, the nice padded ones. Those are your favorites. Oh, same. And then that's a pair of uh, the cheap ones from uh, Harbor Freight. They work fine. Uh, I'll let you all put your hands in them. I've got like four sets of them over here. I went and bought a bulk pack one day. They're just not perfectly seamed, you know, but if you don't really care and you're only doing it as a hobby, they're fine. I mean, so whatever. And then that's a pair of deer, nice deer skin gloves. Uh, like I say, I recommend as a secondary pair. Just kind of keep those in your back pocket all the time. And good luck putting those in your back pocket. <laughs> so goggles. This is a pair just like the ones that Chris had. Uh, you flip them up um, and you can see clearly. Uh, flip them down and... You're blind. Yeah, you're blind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, these are more convenient than the, than the uh, goggle pairs. Uh, the fixed goggles like that in that you can at least flip them up and you're still, your eyeballs are still safe. So that's kind of a trade-off. Now, I'm sure you can find lenses. I haven't seen the round lenses available at uh, Harbor Freight or uh, uh, Northern Tool, but I'm pretty sure if you go to a welding store, welding supply place, they've got that kind of stuff. There. They've got tons of it. There. Um, again, I don't get to those places because I, I work Monday through Friday 9 to 5. So if anybody wants to take a, an afternoon off to go welding material shopping, that'd be a good, a good advice. Uh, welding hood. There's a typical cheap uh, 15 bucks welding hood. Uh, on mine, I took out the actual uh, the, the, the shaded glass so that I could use them just as a protected clear uh, welding hood uh, because they're pretty dark and you have to constantly flip them up to see what you're doing, flip them back down, flip them up, see what you're doing, flip them back down. It gets really annoying, so you end up dropping 100 bucks for one of those. Um, I've seen them as cheap as $50. I've seen them as expensive as three or four hundred dollars. Um, I have a pair, or I have a helmet over there that uh, cost me 100 bucks even at Northern Tool. I was a little nervous about buying it because there was a $200 set made by Hobart right there, and I'm thinking, eh, you get what you pay for, right? The optics, sure. I love these. Uh, they work great. They cost me 100 bucks. Metal man. Uh, you'll see them, they're out there. Um, next slide. Do the colors make you a better welder? Uh, like skull pattern. Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> that is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's like an underwater welding dive helmet or something, but still. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Underwater Ooh, welding is like that. the highest paying trade in the history of the planet besides being famous. Really? So, uh, yeah, it, it makes <clears> lots of money <throat> and your, your chances of dying are like in the double digits. So, oh, <laughs> so shoes! Uh, you're not just limited to cowboy boots. Uh, you know, that's exactly like the pair that I have. Oh, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> Timberlands, um, apparently they make ladies' tight shoes. Uh, good point from Jeremy about the laces. Uh, I'm not going to turn anybody back if they want to ruin their laces, if they want to ruin their shoes. You'd have to drop some huge chunks of slab to, to slag to burn all the way through the laces and the tongue, but one good huge chunk of slag will ruined, you know, as far as their outward appearance, and as long as you can get your feet out of them fairly quick, go right ahead and be my guest, because they need to be closed toe, you need to have your sock protected, because it's going to burn through the sock. Um, but these are examples of ones that I had, I remember before when, when we took a trip to the power plant, uh, I was getting a lot of questions about what closed toe shoe meant, and come on guys, you're going to go see a power plant, you're going to well, buy some real shoes, so anyway, that's what I hope to see in everybody's feet, 
by the next class if you want to actually participate. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to stand back and watch. Um, or <laughs> borrow somebody's shoes. <laughs> if you have a really good friend. <laughs> so shirts. Come to a t-shirt. That's fine. Just bring something like that to throw on when you actually will. Um, on the top right, top left, the pretty expensive shirts. I think 50 and like 150 for those jackets. Um, and they're made by Lincoln and Miller, I think, specifically. Uh, there's a denim shirt in the middle. There's just a plain old Dickies jacket right there. That's great. They're like 30 bucks for a Dickies jacket. Or a flannel shirt. A flannel shirt's fine. You're just going to burn through them a lot quicker than you would a nice Dickies jacket. So, or one of those real expensive, welding specific jackets. So, so where do you buy the Dickies brand? Uh, Walmart. Yeah, Walmart. Uh, you can buy the Northern Tool, too. Northern Tool's got a great selection of, of clothing. Uh, I love that place. It's not as cheap as Harbor Freight, but they're... Even their cheap, no-branded Chinese stuff is much better than Harbor Freight's cheap, no-branded Chinese stuff. So, yeah, sure, sure. They, they, they seem to have some no, of the no finer... No, they are they open on... So buy it five minutes before class. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <That's a great laughs> no, you should, actually, you should be able to leave here at, you know, four or five o'clock and get there if you have the increment uh, and go to Northern Tool and not even have to rush. I think they close at like seven or eight on Sundays mm -hmm. and they close at nine on Sundays. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love going to Northern Tool. Great spot. Field trip. What's that? <laughs> with, field trip was with me. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's a great source for uh, all your safety gear as well, just in general. Um, some of the stuff you can get rock bottom, dirt cheap, at Harbor, or at Harbor Freight, but Northern Tools generally got a nice mix of their house brand. It's, you know, it's generic, but it's better quality. When I've, when I've checked it out, it feels like it's better quality. And then they have name brand stuff there too. They carry Hobart. They carry, uh, uh, I think they carry Lincoln. And they carry Century, which is kind of a, they're trying to become not not generic, but you know, they're still fairly generic as far as the 200-year-old uh, companies. Uh, for, uh, next slide. Yeah, long pants, jeans. Um, Those are tactical pants on top of No, they're Dickies, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're Dickies. Uh, again, I love Dickies. They work pretty well. Um, jeans, of course, are jeans. They work. Um, Anytime. If you're gonna get coveralls, make sure that you got some kind of shirt on because there's nothing quite like getting a piece stuck on the coveralls and you can't. Oh yeah, God. That, that's uh. not fun. So, <laughs> so just make sure you have long pants. Um, again, don't be this guy uh, with huge holes because that's gonna. I'm gonna feel sparks if I try to weld these. Um, by the way, the sparks are not that terrible. They're not the end of the world. You're not gonna immediately get holes in your clothing unless you're welding huge gauge stuff with really high amperage and you're throw it off big chunks. Anything that we're going to do here, anything that you're probably going to want to do as a hobbyist is not going to destroy clothing left and right. It's just going to you know, maybe stain it, uh, give it little little pinpricks of burning, but it's not really going to burn through or cook you. Uh, but if you have a big hole in your knee, you're going to feel it. Uh, next slide. Safety glasses probably don't require a whole lot of uh, explanation. Um, you know, this reminds me, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is I keep a pair of earplugs mm. hanging from my, uh, my little crossbar up there for when I'm grinding. You're going to do more grinding in welding than you're going to do breathing. Mm. Um, you're going to grind more than all the moments you've spent peeing in your life. <laughs> you're going to do a lot of grinding. Get used to it. Uh, <laughs> it's, you're you're going to learn uh, the grinding makes up for all your mistakes. Right yeah, there we go. Jeremy's got the earplug. <laughs> these are the best, by the way. I mean, guys that go shooting at the gun range use these. These, these reduce the sound by just the most, uh, but they're just a little bit annoying to get in. I have a hard hat that I use at work that has a, uh, a pair of big old earmuffs on the side of it that I often use when I'm welding because it also has a, a miner's light. Um, so that's kind of useful. It's a little too far to go, but you can get hard hats with the earmuffs that, um, or just the earmuffs at Harbor Freight or, or Northern Tool or any of those other places. Um, I recommend them because you don't have to stick the little bead in your ear all the time. It's kind of annoying to yeah. stick that little bead in there. Uh, but make sure you try them on with your goggles. Sometimes it can be annoying as well. Um, again, though, you only need them when you're grinding. Uh, so you need goggles when you're grinding, but you don't need them when you're, when you're actually welding. I don't really know the welding process that's so loud you need to put in your place. Um, so oxy fuel. We're going to talk a lot now about a couple of the, the basic um, welding processes that we're going to be looking at. This is a great old picture from an old old welding catalog. Um, that's just a basic oxy assembly welding cart and a basic outline of what materials you need. Um, so you've got your two cylinders. Your oxygen cylinder is usually larger because 
the acetylene is your fuel, but the oxygen is the oxidizer, and that's what actually does the cutting. You'll find that you have the oxygen turned up a lot higher than you need the acetylene. Um, and you can actually get a cut started with, when, you're, when you're doing a torch cut. You can get the, the cut started with the uh, oxygen, um, uh, the acetylene fuel, and then you can actually shut the acetylene off as long as you keep the flame going. You can use the oxygen alone to cut all the way through whatever you're cutting, no matter how thick. So cool. you're going through a lot of oxygen. That's why the bottle is always larger on the, any of those displays. Anybody who has an equal size bottle has got a serious complex with uh, symmetry. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> hey, I have that complex. I got over it really quick. <laughs> so you end up, you have uh, bottles. You have a regulator on them. Um, the regulator is going to control the flow. You don't want to have that bottle straight spewing raw pressure into your, your hose. You get the right amount, um, and it, it'll tell you. Um, I'll show you the pictures of the ray. I'll show you the actual regulators later. Um, hoses, the rubber hoses. Uh, yeah, Goodyear makes them. <coughs> various companies make them. I don't know what you're going to get from Harbor Freight, but I haven't had a problem with any yet. Um, torches, very specific, very particular. Uh, next slide. More torches. Whoa! What way forward? <laughs> Back it up, son. Oh. Well, that was the next slide. Is it the next slide? Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right. Just skip to then, I guess. Let's see what I get. There we go. Okay, so this is like the cheapest entry-level endoxy acetylene. Um, interesting. Now, those are symmetrical. I don't know what Actually, I think the acetylene looks a little bit, a little bit larger. Um, oxygen is almost always green, FYI. Acetylene kind of varies. It's sometimes red, sometimes brown, uh, sometimes black. And I think I've got all three of them. I've got a red one and a black one in my possession right now. My last one was brown. So. Um, this is a basic set from, uh, I think that one's Northern Tool. You can get a similar one from Depot or Lowe's. Um, you're going to pay about 300 bucks for that right there. Um, the bottles are a lot cheaper to fill, but it's a little bit harder to find a place to fill them. The problem with this torch set, though, is it's very hard to find tips for this particular brand. That's 99.9% .9 of the ones you find that fit that model. They're going to be a particular brand called Harris that I do not recommend buying. It works great. They're safe. They're not dangerous or anything, but they just don't have a very wide range of tips that you can even get if you wait and order them online. So I have tips. I have a Harris torch right now. That's I regret it from experience. And uh, I can't get much smaller tips. So when I'm... When I'm Welding small things, I end up melting it a lot. I end up burning it out, blowing it out a lot. And I can't go much smaller or the flame just goes out. So mm -hmm. just a piece of FYI experience for I, you there. I've seen this kit Harbor Freight, the whole thing. They have better kits. Oh, really? of those in another okay. frame. Yeah, again, <laughs> just remember Harris, they're not dangerous. Uh, it's just <clears> hard <throat> to find parts. They work great, but I just don't recommend them. And they're in the big box stores, Depot and Lowe's, so it's common for you to go out and buy them. Don't make my mistake. <laughs> that is the shit. <laughs> that is Victor. They are the kings. They have been the kings for a very long time. They are the popular. They have the most popular uh, line of fittings and, and options and accessories. And the ones that you buy at, at Harbor Freight or Northern Tool, if you go there to buy the knockoffs, you want to buy the Victor style because the Victor tips, the Victor um, you know accessories will screw right onto them. Um, it, they've been lauded all over YouTube and general internet about the Victor stuff at Harbor Freight is good. Next slide. So that's why I recommend it here. Uh, this one's about 129 bucks at Harbor Freight. Um, I watched a video where some guy just gushed about it and welded with it. The bottom line is whether or not the Victor tips will fit it because you're going to want to get a couple of different tips. Somewhere in time, you're going to want to do a real small weld. You're going to want to do like a jeweler size weld on a soda can or something that, of that caliber, something of that gauge. And then you're going to want to weld a, a, a bumper or something. You're going to want to weld something big. So you want the option to get the different tips. Um, and the screw threads are completely different from Victor to Harris. So you don't want to even get stuck in that, in that problem. Next slide. That one's about 130 at uh, Harbor Freight. Okay, this is welding rods that you'll be using for oxyacetylene. 
Um, some of you might be familiar with the uh, welding rods you use for arc welding. They have this stuff on them, this flux. It's a powder chemical, and when it you know gets heated up to 3,000 degrees, it ends up making like a gaseous uh, fog that lays over the, the molten puddle. And it keeps oxygen and nitrogen in the air from interacting with it and making it weak and making it just a bad composition. Um, when you're doing oxy welding, it's fairly pure. The oxyacetylene itself helps keep things blown out. It's a lot less of a problem. Using bare rod is the way to go. I've actually got some bare rod here as well, somewhere. Oh, right here on the table. Um, it's just copper coated steel. It's copper coated so it doesn't rust. Um, it's a very minimal amount of copper and a lot of steel alloys have various elements in them anyway. Maybe even some copper, I'm not sure, but it's been widely used for a long time. It's great stuff to buy. I think this cost me like 15 bucks and it's a pound. I think it's a couple of, you know, it's about 20 rods in there. That'll last me a lot of welding, so. Is this, is that like equivalent to like electronic soldering? Like the solder yeah. element to no, it? No, it's, 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 it's actually steel. Okay. Yeah, it's actually closely matched to the material that you're going to be welding. Well, is that what's, is that what's being the binder or are you heating up or is it so, all sort of combined? No, what you're doing is you're melting the two pieces or more to be joined. Uh -huh. And you're swirling the metal together from the two melting puddles to make it as if it was never separate. It's a, to make it as if it's a continuous piece of the metal. Gotcha. Now, the reason why you need filler rod is because you have drip. You have some of it gets blown away. That's what the sparks become. Mm. Um, sometimes you're filling. Like, I've made a lot of cuts that were short. And um, I should actually be embarrassed by them. but. No need. Uh, I use filler rod. It, if you weld right, it may as well have not been cut short. Okay. And so I can literally fill it in and make sure it's welded. As long as it's liquefied on all sides, it's going to fill that gap just fine. Um, and that's what you need. That's what you need rod for. Okay. Also for penetration, you want to cut. We'll talk about this more when we get into actual welding. But if you have anything thicker than say about an eighth of an inch, you want to put a bevel on it because most welding processes only heat what's so deep. So you put a bevel on it and you weld deep inside of it, you know, say uh, you bevel 45 degrees, about half the thickness, and then you weld the, the base thickness, the base half, and then you give it a minute to cool, you clean it up, you get rid of the slag that forms or anything like that, and then you weld back over it uh, a little bit of a swirl, kind of a one and a half thickness, to, just to get the whole thickness. Otherwise, if you just try to weld the top, you're not going to go all the way through. You're going to have like a perforated or semi a scored piece of metal that's just waiting to bend. So, so, so you mean to like grind it down, kind of give like a little bevel on that? Okay, yes. Gotcha. Yes, and you keep your bottom half, you know, the same precise length that you need. Okay. Uh, you just kind of bevel. Um, you good, Jeremy? Okay. Yeah, so MIG welding uses a, it's, it's kind of essentially an arc welding technology, only it feeds the wire to the tip along with a shielding gas. So you hook up the, the umbilical and it has a spool inside the welder. You'll see that uh, later uh, when we actually look at my welder. It has a spool inside the welder that's fed by a motor, and it also has a gas tank on the back of the welder that's, that feeds in the right pressure that you dial in based on what you need. And it out, outputs, if you notice, there's a copper tip and then there's a sort of a dual thickness brass tip. That dual thickness there is right where they're injecting the gas that just kind of floods out. That tip normally clamps on, it's just taken off to show you the, the, the in intricacies of it. And that usually that whole area is kept with enough pressure that you just kind of have a gas cloud there. It's invisible, but you know it's there, you can hear it, you can feel it. And it just protects the oxygen and nitrogen from reaching the actual weld. Then the spark itself, it's conductivity to that tip. And that tip uh, it energizes the actual wire that's coming out. And so the wire, about a half inch out past that copper tip is where your actual welding is taking place, just right at the end of that shield, that, that little cover that goes over top of it. You have a trigger down here. When you squeeze the trigger, it activates the motor and the gas solenoid and the electricity all at the same time. And MIG is the greatest thing. It seems so complicated, but it works really well. Love it. Can't wait to uh, show it to you. I, I can't wait to do it again. I just love this stuff. Uh, <laughs> Next one, metal inert gas. Yes, there you go, MIG. Not to be confused with Mikorian Goskovsky or whatever the hell that guy is that makes his airplanes. Um, <laughs> oh, I, this, this answers my question. All right. <clears throat> so for aluminum welds, 100% argon. I've got a small tank of argon over there. Argon's fairly expensive. 
Um, my small tank is uh, two feet high, and not even two feet high, and it costs the same amount to fill up as my three, four foot high um, carbon dioxide argon mix tank. Um, it's fairly expensive. It's almost exclusively useful for aluminum. Most steels are going to use what they call 25%. It's a 25% argon CO2 mixture. Um, I don't question. They've done a lot of trial and error and a little bit of metallurgical studies. That's the best stuff to use for your basic steels. I don't know. We had one guy uh, who was into racing, uh, wanted to do a race car welding. They almost exclusively use chromoly. I'm not sure if you use a different material for that. I know for stainless steel, you want to use either pure CO2 or preferably a helium or helium mix. And if you go to a welding supplier and you tell them you need to buy a bottle and you tell them what you're going to be welding, they'll get you the right stuff. Um, those guys, I've never met a guy at a welding supply store that didn't know what he was talking about, at least remotely. So, but this is an example. It's definitely different uh, gases. I own four bottles. I've got an oxygen, I've got an acetylene, I've got a 25% uh, mix, and I've got a, uh, a little argon bottle. Um, right now it's going to waste because I don't have a gun for the aluminum. But hey. Uh, the things you learn. Uh, next slide. Do these gases have like a shelf life on them or anything like that? No, they're almost, you know, they're, they're fairly what they say, pure yeah. argon or gotcha. whatever the half-life is of a natural element. Right, right. Know, for letting you know. So here's a generic. Um, you know, I wonder if this is the same brand. Eastwood has a catalog out there with a lot of really cool um, manufacturing tools and stuff like fabrication parts. Um, sheet metal benders, tubing benders, and all that. It's a great toy store catalog to get. I don't know if that's their house brand or not. This is a perfect example of a MIG welder that I probably wish I had gotten because, as you can see, it has a gun. Um, it has a whole different umbilical there that has the gun part of it. A lot of them, they have a gun that mounts on the umbilical that you have. But that gun, that spool, is for aluminum wire. The aluminum just doesn't make it all the way down that 8 or 10 foot umbilical without causing binding back inside the box. It just won't feed it. The aluminum's not rigid enough. Uh -huh. So they feed it from right there at the end, and it's rigid enough to go 8, 12 inches to the end of the gun. Huh. But those guns end up setting you back another 200 bucks. I have thought about, if anybody's interested, I've thought about goofing around trying to make my own in the art hacker space, right? Huh. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so here's your ground clamp. You're going to clamp that to the work. Uh, there's a little shield and some extra tips. Um, that looks like copper wire. Again, it's steel coated with copper. Most of them are. Some brands, some tips I've read in some magazines in various places recommend against using a uh, uh, copper coated MIG wire because it, it'll slicken up the MIG uh, feeding rollers. They're like sort of a high pressure roller. Um, I recommend just cleaning the damn thing. The copper, I don't weld that often. I mean, I weld often for a hobbyist, but still not often enough to go through a pound or two pounds of wire. I don't want it to rust. I, I, you know, when it gets to be that bad, I'll take the thing apart and I'll clean it. Um, it, it really comes down to, if you're a pro, you probably would not want to use the copper. You're going to go through it way too fast. You don't want to be cleaning it all the time. If you're a hobbyist, I'd recommend going with the copper. Um, and then that regulator is generally geared towards argon or, or the 25%. Um, it'll do either one. Um, just don't you have to really worry enough so much about bleeding it out. Um, when we actually work with MIG, you'll see that you want to just waste a little bit of gas and make sure your line is clear of oxygen before you go. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have a problem being mixed. Uh, CO2 is the other component of the 25%, so either way you're using argon. Um, I, would, I have not done any helium uh, stainless steel welding, so I don't know for certain if it would work fine for helium as well. I'd have to ask. Again, if you go that far, you're going to ask at the store when you buy it. So, uh, A cheap regulator. You probably get a cheap regulator for like 50 bucks, you know, a, a, again, a Chinese knockoff, something like that. Name brand, you're going to pay like 200 bucks. Um, they're fairly expensive. I got a cheap knockoff, it works great for me. So, Next slide. And there's a picture of the actual process of MIG welding. Uh, as you can see, just hold this finger in your hand and there's that little shield, you can kind of see it. And Right there at the end is molten sparking. That's the shield in your hand. You do it. That's the actual the actual welding gun in your hand, and then the shielding gas is in the middle of all that. Oh, I see. Yeah. So here's something you're gonna do a lot. I keep a pair of bows, diagonal cutters, side cutters, dikes, whatever you want to call them. Um, these are well worn. What happens is you get a little bit too close to the work, and you end up welding the wire to the tip of that copper electrode in the center. 
and it just sticks. And, and you know, and it won't turn anymore. Um, sometimes you'll press the button, you'll hear the motor turning, you'll, you'll hear the gas coming out, it'll even be sparking, but the wire's not feeding anymore. That's because it just kind of welds, you get a little too close. So you just take a pair of cutters out, and you just pull on it, and you snap off the tip. You get used to it. You're gonna waste a little bit of make wire. It's something you just do. Especially when you're done with a whole roll, you got like nine feet in the, in the umbilical you can't use because the feeder's back there and you really can't use it. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I got into smelting. I can't wait to get my aluminum and uh, <laughs> I'm building mine to go and melt steel too. So hopefully I'll be mm-hmm. pouring some cast out of a lot of my steel scrap. Next slide. <clears throat> okay. And there's a guy. Okay, shoe and metal arc welding. Schma. Arc welding, aka stick welding. Um, this is, again, the oldest and most popular of the welding methods. This guy is welding the side of a pipeline. You can use this stuff anywhere. It's even used underwater. It's used, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't get how the electricity works on that, but it's been used underwater for years. I trust him that it works. Um, he's going all the way around a pipeline. It's the most versatile. It's the best for the thickest material. You're gonna weld a ship with this. You're gonna weld six inch holes with this kind of stuff. A lot of passes, don't get me wrong, a lot of passes. But um, that's that's really the, I wouldn't say the holy grail, but it's the stuff. If you want to be a welder, if you really want to be a welder, this is the stuff to learn. The the uh, striking the arc with this is a little bit trickier. Get, doing a good job with it is a little bit trickier than a MIG, but it's much more versatile. It can do a lot thicker work, and it can do a lot of different types of, um, uh, of, of electrodes can be used. Next slide. Yeah, so this one I got a little bit of info from another slide presentation I found out there, just a little bit extra tips. So it's uh, considered manual arc welding because it doesn't have any sort of electric, uh, manual feeding or uh, automatic feeding or anything like that. Um, it's generated by an electrical arc between the flux covered as consumable rod, that's the electrode that I was showing you guys earlier, wherever I, wherever I put that, um, and the actual work. And that's why they call it stick welding because the electrode is a stick. Um, so the com- combustion and decomposition of the electrode creates a gaseous shield. That's what the flux does. When it, when it vaporizes, it kind of hangs around for a while, and that helps protect the weld puddle in the, the crucial moments it takes for it to solidify uh, so it doesn't get uh, infected by uh, oxygen or nitrogen, which actually hurts the quality of the metal. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> and when you're done, they end up, you end up with a slag. It's kind of like glassy... Um, dirty crap that's on the top of the weld bead and you have to chip that off with a chipping hammer. It's, you just scrape it away. You could probably leave it, but you need to see your weld to see if you did a decent job. Um, so you chip it off. It also gives you a chance to see if your weld's terrible and it actually breaks apart um, when you chip off the slag. And that slag, again, it protects it. You leave it on for at least a minute or two. It protects the weld while the metal heals, or while the metal solidifies. Next slide. So as I was mentioning earlier, the most popular welder in the world is that red buzz box right there. Actually, I lie because that's the one with the DC option. That one's about 780 bucks retail. Um, I think you can get them on sale at you know, various suppliers as cheap as 600. Um, and the one without the DC option, which is just considered the classic buzz box, I've seen them as low as three, 329. I really want the one you're looking at right there. The options are great. The price is great. It's not too expensive. They can do so much. And Lincoln is like the most famous brand in welding. The only other one that comes close is Miller. Um, depending on who you're, it's like a Ford versus Chevy battle. Uh, welders loving Lincoln versus Miller. Um, that's a real common um, Miller uh, buzz box welder, an AC welder. It's fine. Oh, um, okay. This is a better picture of the electrodes. Um, Again, you see this guy is working here with the stinger, is what they call this, the, the, the little clamp that you put the electrode in. You just put it in there at a little bit of an angle, you hold it in your hand to guide it. It's real tricky to try to guide something that's 18 inches long from a you know, far distance. Anybody in their right mind is going to be shaking a little bit. Uh, so you hold it and you just kind of work your way back. Uh, so some other pictures I've seen, they, they keep a stack of electrodes real close, like up on top of that pipe right there, because you go through them pretty quick. And you just, you're swapping them out constantly. You're just putting a new one on, you're moving further. You're moving them on, put them on, you're moving further. Now that's production work. If you're doing hobbyist work, you probably don't mind. You're going to go back and forth. You're going to be amazed that you just weld a new stick. And you're like, wow, check it out. You know, you'll have plenty of time to walk across your garage and, and get another stick. 
Um, notice there's adjustments on here. This little <coughs> crank wheel is, is literally changing the, uh, the, the, the transformer inside, changing the, the contacts. Huh. Um, that is an AC only one. That AC DC one there allows you to change between, you know, again, uh, various various uh, amperages of DC. Or TIG. About what makes TIG able to weld aluminum because I can't find a TIG welder advertised as aluminum capable for less than twelve or fourteen hundred dollars. And mm -hmm. I'm like, why? Well, one of the things I, I kind of got a basic concept of is that it alternates the current not so much in a sine wave as a square wave. A square wave with slopes to it. Mm -hmm. And the point is, if you just imagine the complexity of the physics that are involved, I don't really have the language to explain it right now, but adjusting the pitches of the rise and fall of that square wave, adjust the depth versus how clean it welds, mm -hmm. um, how much energy is put into it, and how quickly it's pulsed versus how long it's pulsed. And these things, depending on the thickness and the specific alloy, you can probably imagine right now that there's an intricacy there that, that you can appreciate once you get experience with it. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the experience, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I wish I had a nice TIG, I don't so far, I can't wait, one day I will. Hopefully we'll be able to get one more fun. Huh. So, but TIGs are awesome, they're beautiful. Are TIGs separate from all the ones you showed before? Yes, yeah. yes, I've got a little bit of TIG okay. at the end. Next slide. Hold on. You just need to change battery. Okay. No more subject. Okay. Okay, so Rob, go ahead with your question. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know. Um, as a hobbyist, what type of welding would be the most used? Is there is there an all around type of welding that I should just kind of look for? Right. So I'll tell you like the first chapter or so of Richard Finch's welding book over there does. Um, this guy, this guy, uh, his claim to fame was he's done some welding projects for the space shuttle. So obviously, ooh, right? The guy knows how to weld. Um, one of the things that he says is basically, I'm sure I'm paraphrasing him, is any man who wants to weld can gas weld anything. You can gas weld anything. Um, you're basically melting the two pieces and swirling them together. It may be a lot harder than TIGGING or a lot harder than MIGGING or maybe not quite as useful for going as deep as a stick. But you can gas weld anything, and you can also use it as a torch to cut. So it's highly recommended that everybody get a gas welding setup. Now that said, if you want to get started, a MIG, don't fall for a wire feed only, a flux feed, because it's really messy. A lot of people want to buy those in the cheapest one you can get, period. It's basically a MIG without the gas, and it's not worth it. It makes a mess. Um, if you're in a hobby weld, you probably care at least a little bit about what it looks like and you're not going to be happy with that. Um, you can use it in a pinch. You can put that same wire in a MIG and use it. It just makes a mess. It sends little, little bits of metal all over the place and it just really makes a mess out of your weld. Um, a MIG is probably the best advice for any hobbyist. It's clean. Um, it's Once you get it set up, you can weld for hours with it without having to work on it. Um, whereas with a TIG or, you know, or um, a stick, you've got to constantly change out the tips or constantly change out the rod. Um, I, I mean, I recommend a decent MIG, no doubt. Um, but at the same time, everybody should be getting an acetylene setup. So basically, uh, get the MIG and make sure you've got your, your calendar cleared and buy your gas setup as soon as possible. Um, okay. So definitely. Good question. Really good question. Uh, next slide. Yes, the great famous buzz box. There's a parting picture. So, um, yeah, if you want absolute versatility and you want to join the Manly Welders Club, get this guy. He can do anything. Manly Welders Club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, word about tape. Uh, this little pink tip thing here. <clears throat> is what those big, gruff, manly welders use. And he's holding it properly, um, like a pencil, practically. Um, looks kind of scary. What it does is it feeds gas, much like a MIG, through that shroud, through that handle. And what it stands for is tungsten inert gas. That little crazy Bride of Frankenstein hat off the back of it holds a tungsten electrode. Uh, say six inches long, looks like a pencil. And, you know, you can experiment with sharpening the tips to certain levels. 
make it a point, make it a ball, make it a slope tip, make it like a chisel tip, and it'll affect different welding in different ways. And it makes a really hot point of light right there at the tip. It doesn't spread as much. If you don't, uh, some of you have done electrical, electronic welding, you're aware of, uh, you know, the, the heat affects all the components. The longer you keep that soldering iron tip there, it can cause a lot of damage. That's sort of a similar uh, uh, comparison to carry over to TIG. That's one of the good things about TIG is it keeps them, it, it gets hot really quick right now, right here. And it's just, it's a beautiful material to use. You'll, you'll see a picture in a few slides uh, of a nice weld. Again, you're using a bare rod to fill it with because the inert gas is coming through that line. Here's that picture I was kind of mentioning to you earlier. So there is TIG, AC TIG, standard TIG. And now this is an expensive make. And it's doing a pulse, not just AC current, not, I mean, not just your standard uh, 60 hertz or, or whatever. That's a, a, a MIG that's capable of being kind of dialed in. And that's the kind of how clean you can get those welds. Now notice the burning along the edges. It's very, very close. That's indicative of the really hot, really precise tip. It keeps the, the, keeps the heat damage from being all over the place. It's right there. You're able to move pretty quick. You're able to move pretty precise and pretty clean with an expensive MIG or a decent, you know, or any TIG pretty much. Um, and that's just a picture of really well done um, MIG or TIG welds. A lot of things that are manufactured, uh, you may have looked at the welds, that's what they are. You're not going to get that from anything for less than 1500 bucks. So um, kind of out of our range. So just so I know what I'm looking at, that was, that was, those were both welded from right to left? Or right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And what you're doing with that is you're just kind of, they're moving in a pattern like this as they go. Yeah. And that's okay. giving them that, that's what's causing that, by the way. What, what, what does most manufacturing welds use? TIG. TIG. Okay. TIG, hands down. So TIG is pretty much, pretty much the best precise wise. It is. It's expensive. Yeah. It's particular. Um, a lot of robots... Uh, there is a lot of meat going on in robots. Okay. What there's not in manufacturing is gas right. and stick. Mm -hmm. um, when you need it done right, you send a person out there with a stick okay. for the heavy duty stuff. So. Next, I think we're. Fine. Do you want to go back to that other slide, or do you want to just keep trucking? No, we're good. This isn't the last slide. This is the last slide. So that's a picture of a beautiful, well, I love that coloring. If that's not chromoly, it's stainless, stainless chromoly. I don't know what that is for sure, but beautiful. Now, my MIG actually made a color like that. I was so tickled when I saw that. I've been welding with uh, with gas for, for three or four years, um, you know, as a hobbyist. And, and, uh, by the way, it's really neat to weld on concrete. Hmm. You ever welded on concrete? It explodes yes. after a while. It scares the holy shag, it spreads rock all over you, it hurts. It's the neatest experience in the world. I shouldn't have told you that when you all experience it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some fire bricks I just picked up. That's the right thing to weld on. Um, either fire bricks or over open air, prop things up so that the joint you're welding it on, on is over open air. Fire bricks, uh, I got them rated right to 3,000 degrees, so the welding processes are going to be in the in the so why does the concrete so, explode? So basically, <laughs> water that's it? porous that you yeah. expand? It's not that it's porous. Concrete is actually a large quantity of water. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a good prepared chemistry lecture, but you know, different compounds are made of different materials and they can completely change form with the additive of just one single element or one additional electron per molecule. It can completely change the, con the, the construct of the, of the particular item. The hydrogen, two hydrogens and one oxygen of water are readily used up in the uh, uh, process of, of putting together the concrete molecules. And when you heat them up to a certain point, they get excited and they end up turning back into, um, into water again, basically. Uh, one of the things that I like to look at, I mentioned to people, is all that smoke from when the towers fell. A lot of that was from the water vapor coming back out of the concrete again during the fall along with the combustion and the burning of things. But it's, yeah. people just don't realize that. And I actually learned that from a, uh, a chemist at the concrete plant from outside of town here, uh, Capital Cement. I worked there for about six months on a contract. And I got to work with a guy who uh, got a couple of patents in concrete 
uh, cement. I'm sorry, they call it cement. And um, he gave me some really cool electron microscope pictures and something about the processes of cement. It's neat stuff. Huh. Neat stuff. But yeah, it's actually it's vaporizing back into water again. If you want to call it vaporizing, I guess that's what it is. And then it just expands and kind of. It's trapped. Up, it's yeah. trapped inside of concrete. Yeah, yeah. And when it gets trapped, when it vaporizes, it expands its volume. Right. You know, exponentially, instantaneously, right. and it just blows out fissures. Huh. Uh, you say firewalks? Is it, are these kind of like little bricks? You kind fire of bricks. Yeah. So it's um, fire clay. There's another whole new thing I'm into. Uh, that okay? <laughs> You'll learn about that during the um, during the making your own uh, smelter, aluminum smelter. Um, there's a lot of different materials in the dirt, rock, and cement world, um, and the different one of the one of the things that you're looking to attain um, in this particular discussion is heat uh, resistibility or heat refractory uh, uh, characteristics. And fire clay is used mixed with smaller quantities of sand and yada yada to make various levels of, it might crack sooner, but it can stand heat better. Um, it might be more brittle, it might take longer to cure, but it can withstand heat better. Uh, versus it's a lot difficult to run it around in a, in a tractor trailer with a tumbler and dump it in your driveway, it's not gonna be very conducive to that. There's different drawbacks and different compositions mm. of masonry materials. Um, I can't believe I'm going for a double D, right? Should be a what's, the, like, what's the cheaper option if like, you can't afford fire bricks? I mean, I don't know. Like, so, actually, I found out just yesterday. I thought they were expensive too. A buck twenty a piece, and I forgot to put one in my bag on the way out the door. I didn't think I would need it this week, but I'll have it next week. They're about this big, uh, A high. They cost me a buck twenty a piece at Keller Materials. You can buy a single brick if you want. You can walk in the door and say, I want some fire bricks. About 16 of them yesterday. And uh, also, as there is a cheaper method. There's another method. I don't know if it's necessarily cheaper, but you buy fire clay, you buy sand, you buy some perlite, uh, you buy some Portland cement, you mix them together with various formulas. Look online. There's all sorts of information about this because it goes into people that want to build everything from pizza ovens to steel smelters. And there's just a huge hobbyist community out there about this stuff. And there's different recipes you can look up and mix together. In fact, just yesterday, I spent like a hundred bucks. And I've got four, five, five-gallon buckets of various grain, uh, two different grits of sand, some Portland cement, some um, fire clay, and uh, some some bentonite clay. And I can use that to mix together to make all sorts of work back for me. So hopefully by the November sixth class, I'll have our, or not November, I think it's later than November twenty something. I'll have our uh, our aluminum forward ready to go. Cool. Um, so. If I wanted to set up a place to weld at home, and all I have is a cement garage with a very low wooden overhang, how would I best mitigate those? It's not not a problem. The yeah. the, the the fire damage is the fire danger is really like the a foot. Okay. No, you're not welding is not making um, you're not making the fires of hell. Yeah. It's yeah. It, they're they're in a real small area. Okay. Um, so keep your extinguisher close by, keep mm -hmm. your hose close by in case the extinguisher can't handle it. Mm -hmm. um, ventilation, you know, minimal really. You just, okay. just get a fan, something, okay. to, something to blow it out. It, it also depends on what you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, I gas well in a closed garage. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pretty big garage. It's about the size of a quarter of the space here, 600 square feet. I don't know. And it, uh, yeah, it gets a little smelly. It smells like metal and cooking. Yeah. My lady gets in trouble for it all the time. But, uh, Okay. I'll fire up the uh, torches here in a little bit and okay. just show you. Um, it's not that big a deal. You can totally do it. Uh, so, just get so a couple fire bricks so it's yeah. off the concrete. Gotcha. So anyone can buy the bombs and store them at home? Yes. Even here in the city? Yes. With yes. no restric restrictions for that? Like I said in my email, I was originally petrified that these things were going to explode and kill me in a ball of fire and flame and pain. <laughs> I, had, me too. I, I had a couple of pops. Uh, when the tip gets really hot, there gets a, bit, a little bit of a flashback inside the tip and it pops and it goes out. I've gotten to the point now where I'm not even scared of that anymore. Uh -huh. It's not going to kill me. Uh, yeah. you've got I kind of remember that. Everybody yeah. here. From class 25 years yes, ago. Yes, you remember the, the scary you, pops? And, and you had the handle on the yes. cutting torch? Yes. So yeah. you heat it up first, huh? Yeah. And I think the handle just feeds the oxygen. It feeds, it feeds a lot. It feeds a higher portion of oxygen. Yes. Yeah. It, so it's like the oxygen that actually cuts it comes from that. Yeah. Um, the so oxygen you suddenly mix makes a flame that heats it up and then you blast it with more oxygen. Yeah, because I remember there's always this, I'm shaking and then you 
dip the tip in that. Yes. And goes bang. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. And, and that's for, actually for, first time I was jumping like five feet in the air. Well, you'll notice and the tenth time it's like your okay. tips are made of brass, and you'll notice that those little explosions are taking little bits of material off the end. You don't really want those. <clears throat> Eventually, you might blow that tip up and maybe get a piece of brass in your eyes. Yeah, I guess that's why they're interchangeable. Yeah, exactly. And you have a little cleaning. I'll show you in a minute when we look at the tools yeah. over there. We've got little cleaning deals that go in there, kind of like pipe yeah, and I remember that the teacher was never happy when I did that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, one question that I, I meant to ask earlier. So, so what, is there any big difference between <clears throat> cutting and welding versus like how you set everything up or? Yes. Well, it's a different tip. Okay. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So the welding tip generally is, is, uh, it, there's nothing mechanical to it. It's a real basic feel. You mix in a little bit of oxygen and a little bit of acetylene. You adjust it to the right flow, the right sound, the uh -huh. right look, and you're, you're ready to go. With the uh, cutting tip, it's actually a bit more mechanical in nature because you have the base just like you have with a welding tip. But then you also have, it's basically like a two-stage oxygen feed. So you have a base amount of oxygen that you feed for the flame, and then you have like an all-the-way-on full blast that, huh. you, that you get when you squeeze the oxygen lever down. Yeah. And that will basically give you all that the regulator is putting out, whereas the tip itself, or both of them, have additional oxygen um, up or down huh. the tip. So does, yeah, that, does that require a separate regulator? No, no, no. Okay. You, um, the, the, uh, the oxygen, or the torches, uh -huh. have a, they're half and half. You can take off the end of it and put on either an oxygen, or either a welding tip or a cutting tip. Oh, okay. And I got so you. So that's... They're modular the way they're the way they're built. Huh. Um, the best you might want to adjust the pressures on the regulator based on what you're doing, but I don't how to do that either. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. That's it for the classwork. Woo! Class work. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Thank you. Longer than I thought, but I hope it was okay for everybody. I had a lot.